The book of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah was an Israelite priest who lived and worked in Jerusalem during the final decades of the kingdom of southern Judah. He was called as a prophet to warn Israel about the severe consequences of breaking their covenant with God through their idolatry and injustice, and he even predicted that the empire of Babylon would come as God's servant to bring this judgment on Israel by destroying Jerusalem taking the people into exile. And sadly, his words became reality. Jeremiah lived through the siege and destruction of Jerusalem and witnessed the exile personally. Israel hasn't turned back to their God, and so in the first year of Babylon's new king, Nebuchadnezzar, God tells Jeremiah to announce that the Babylonian armies are headed for Israel and all of its neighbors to conquer them and take them into exile for 70 years. He compares Babylon to a cup of wine filled to the brim with God's just anger at all of Israel's injustice and idolatry. God will make Israel and the nations drink from this cup. Now this chapter is key to the book's design because everything that follows is going to focus on Babylon's coming attack. First on Israel in chapters 26 to 45 and then on the other nations in chapters 46 to 50. The section about Israel first contains stories about how Jeremiah begged Israel to turn back, how he warned them right up to the last minute, but the leaders of Israel kept rejecting him. The section concludes with a large collection of stories about how Jerusalem was under siege and eventually destroyed by Babylon, and about how Jeremiah was persecuted all through that time and eventually kidnapped and taken against his will to Egypt by a group of Israelite rebels. Now, right here in the middle, in between all of these dark stories of disaster and judgment, is a collection of Jeremiah's messages of hope for Israel's future. So he picks up on Moses' prediction that after Israel had broken the covenant and gone into exile, see Deuteronomy 30, God would not abandon his people. Rather, he would renew his covenant with them and transform their hearts. Jeremiah develops this promise and he says that God is going to one day inscribe the laws of the Torah, not on tablets, but rather on the hearts of his own people. He's going to heal their rebellion so that they can truly one day love and follow him fully. And so one day, Israel will return back to the land and the Messiah from the line of David is going to come and that's when all nations will come to recognize Israel's God as the true God. Okay, let's take that information and let's apply it. So I know that we come with a variety of reasons why we're here. Some are coming to find out a little bit more about who God and and this whole Jesus following thing is about. And some are coming because it's like, teach me some more. I want to know a little bit more about this book. And ultimately, my hope for you is that you will find yourself more aware of God in your life. So I want to give you a few updates. Now, if you're, I'm not going to go through the whole like recap of last week. You're going to have to go watch that online if you want to get caught up. But I think you need a couple key pieces, so let's make sure we know where we are. We're looking at in history here. Uh, we, we've gone through the book of Ezekiel. We're back now and went back in time to Jeremiah. Uh, Jesus will come at that end of the spectrum, and uh, Abraham and the covenant happened back here, for those that understand that in the book of Genesis. And then we have the fall of Israel. This is a key piece for us to remember, that Israel was broken into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom referred to as the kingdom of Israel, and then Judah, two tribes who developed this kingdom of Judah. Now, the northern kingdom was already in captivity, and what was left was Judah. So that's really the focus of what we're looking at in the book this week. Uh, And then we're talking about Jeremiah, so just a few reminders known as that weeping prophet, right? And we read last week how he refers to himself if only he could have like his head a spring of water, because there's just so much tears that he has and so much heartbreak for his people. Um, So the weeping prophet, he gets to go into different difficult situations. He gets to go proclaim God's word. I say gets to because it is a gift that God gives us when he lets us share his truth. But it's not easy. And so we read about how he said, I'm too young. And God sharply said, don't say that. And then we read how he said, I can't speak. And God said, yeah, we'll be quiet for a minute and I'm going to take care of that too. And he touches his mouth and gives him the words, right? So God has a plan for him. We also just briefly touched on this idea that God has a plan for you too. And that God knew Jeremiah before he was ever in his mother's womb. And we can carry that thinking to you today. That you were known before you were ever born. 
God knew you and he had a plan for you. So that was kind of a key piece that we went on. And the second part we got to was the fact that Jeremiah's job was to go and proclaim a judgment that was coming on the land, the Jew, on the kingdom of Judah. And this is the, 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 the summary of it is this from chapter 25. The whole country will become a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Not only the uh, Judah, but the other nations around will be under this captivity. So this is placed out over them, and it was fulfilled, and it followed exactly as Jeremiah said it would, as God spoke through him. And so one of the things that happens, though, is people tend to read the Old Testament, and they say, God's really angry, and then they read the New Testament, and it's just so loving, and that's the God I want to follow, and that is the same God, okay? So you can't say there's a different God. It's God. God of old and new is God. And so uh, one of the, there's this movie called Bruce Almighty, and he says this thing, that God is like this kid with a giant magnifying glass, and all he wants to do is burn my feelers off and watch me squirm, and, and some people have that picture of God. Why is God so angry? And we talked about this last week. What is one of the key things that was going on and continues to go on, but this was a very severe issue, is that they were worshiping idols and to the extent that they were sacrificing their children on these altars. And I, so I asked the question personally. Let's just go personal. For those of you who have children, I decide to come to your house. And I say, oh, don't worry everything's good, I'm going to take your child, and I go and I kill your child. Would you be justified to be angry? Uh, Yeah. And so that is basically, in in a nutshell, one of the things that is happening. People are slaughtering and killing God's children. Does he have the right to be angry? Yeah, that's not sin. In fact, we're told, in your anger, do not sin. And I think we can see God doesn't need us to justify anything he does, but he has all authority to be angry in this moment, along with the fact that they continue to steal and murder and lie and take advantage of the, we- the widows and those who are orphans and all kinds of things in the community. Ultimately, they weren't pointing the world to the goodness of God. They were living as if they were the world. And God said, that's not okay, so guess what? Captivity is coming. In fact, a lot of people read this that God's going to destroy all the people. That's what I would do. That's not what God does, right? God says, I'm going to take away everything to regain your attention on me. So all the city stuff you've built up, I'm going to destroy it. All the comfort you've had, I'm going to take it away. And I think sometimes in our own lives, God uh, works that way. He says, I have to remove a few things because they become idols in your life or the blocking the conversation between you and me. So there's captivity coming. And in that process, I will cleanse you and help you regain focus because I've warned you and it didn't work. (laughs) And I told you again and you wouldn't listen. And that's really the heart of what we're at here is the problem was they would not listen. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read this or see this, but just look at the highlighted uh, pieces as he says um, to Jeremiah, you're going to speak these words, but they won't listen. The weak, these wicked people refuse to listen, yet they did not listen. They did not listen, and they won't heed my words. And on and on he goes, 57 times in the book of Jeremiah, referencing times when God says, they won't listen to me. I give them the warnings, I tell them what's coming. I give them hope and say, if you stop, you can still live here, and they won't listen. And this is the problem. And this is the problem today. And the question I ask for you is, are you listening to God? Are you listening? So I take uh, a personal story. Let Let me tell you my story a little bit. Before I came on staff, it's been almost 10 years now, which is really weird. God, I still say, has an amazing sense of humor that he would let me come and be here and talk to you today. It certainly wasn't on my list of my plans and hopes and dreams, and yet God is so awesome. See, I was a school teacher for 12 years, and in that process, about year six, uh, I actually applied for a children's pastor position here. God was speaking, and he was challenging, and then I said, no way, and I backed out, and I ran and hid, and I said, that's ridiculous. That was like 15 years ago, 16 years ago. I said, no way. God, why would you call me to that? I mean, look at who I am. Might even have said, I'm too young, and I can't speak, perhaps. 
And then time goes on and God continues to work some more and he speaks and, and I'm wrestling in my heart as he's communicating to me in a way that I can't describe to you. It wasn't audible. And so I came back and I uh, applied for a youth pastor position and turned in that application and even went into the process of going through interviews and I ran. I was like, no way. And I knew that I wasn't ready and God knew I wasn't ready, but he was moving and he was moving. And three years went by again. I found myself applying again for the youth pastor. And when it looked like basically the job was more or less the position, the calling was ready for me, man, I wrestled with God. I was like, you want me to stop an education track that I've been on like toward leading perhaps even a whole district and I was working for the state of Oregon and I was uh, traveling with the University of Portland and I was getting another master's degree and I had all this stuff and I had my retirement figured out at 35, was ready. And I thought, God, you want me to leave that? I mean, look what I've been doing. And, and he's like, yeah, I do. <laughs> oh, that's great. And you know, when I look back, I can remember year one, I just thought, why did I wait so long? Like, I know this is what you designed me for. Why? And I remember a friend of mine, Bob Young, he said, uh, you didn't wait too long. God brought you in when you were ready, when he spoke to you. So here's a question for you. Are you listening to God? You know, he speaks in lots of ways. He speaks when we read his word. He speaks. See, if you're a follower of Christ, he speaks by his spirit. As we pray, he speaks. As we meet with other believers, he speaks. In our situations, he speaks. And the question is, are you listening? Are you perhaps no different than the Israelites and perhaps not listening? As God presses into areas and says, I really am calling you to go do this. Or, I need you to change this. I need you to, to stop this. Are you listening? So that's my first question. See, we can't separate ourselves, even though on the spectrum of time, this book is far written from us. There are universal principles that we must look at. And so the fact is that God is serious about you. And the question is, are you serious about God? I want you to evaluate that as we go through today and just think, are you serious about God? Are you listening? Well, as we listen to God... God responds. And then God, when we work with him, begins to work through us. And so the next chapter pieces we're going to look at is something happens. When Jeremiah goes out and does the work that he was called to, he actually runs into some difficulties. In fact, last week we talked about God said, don't worry, I will rescue you. And we find out in our book here into uh, chapter 20 that he ends up becoming the victim of persecution. And it says that he was beaten. So this guy, Pasher, one of the priests, by the way, beats him and puts him in stocks, as it says here, at the Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. So he's at the temple itself, put on display. Here's this guy, beaten and now on display for you for what he's doing. And what he's doing is what God called him to, but what they're hearing is not what they want to hear. And so they beat him. And they put him on display, and eventually he gets released. But then the next one comes, and there's a death sentence put on him. So we look in chapter 26, it says, Then the priests and the prophets, so there were other prophets, so there's a dueling prophet problem. We have true prophets of God and false prophets of God. And they're in competition. Well, the priests and the prophets said to the officials and to all the people, this man deserves a sentence of death because he prophesied against the city, as you've heard with your own ears. This guy's talking about destroying the city. He should die for this. And so sometimes we read this and we think, man, that is, that's a big deal. Back then, that must have been so scary. But that's not real like now. That's not real now. So I want to share a story with you, and I, I have to read the letter itself because I'm afraid if I tell you the story, I'll give a name or a location that I can't share with you because we're, we're recording. And so what I want to tell you is that uh, we have some missionaries in Africa. That's a broad enough area. And those missionaries are going to be coming here in about two months, and you're going to get a chance to meet the people I'm talking about. 
if you choose to put that time away. But here's a letter. This was last year. So let, let me just share a story. It says this, Lately there's been the blowing of a wind of persecution in our region, and we have not been spared. However, the Lord gives us ways to always stay in our community. But this time, we were forced to leave the village where you found us in 2016 because of this persecution. So when I visited them shortly after that, they were forced to leave. It says, indeed, while we were still in this village, a young man gave himself to Jesus, and this eventually provoked the anger of the local religious leaders. Sound familiar? See, but these are Muslim leaders. It says, then the young man was almost assaulted, and the Lord allowed us to quickly get him out of that area um, because we knew there was a plot being prepared against him. Now, these, when they say a plot, that's not just to go and like punch him and kick him and then say, stop it. This is like a death sentence plot. Okay? It says, he was able to find refuge and encouragement from some of the believers in the community. And there are a few of them, by the way. And later, when the atmosphere had calmed down, we brought him back to the community, and he continues to live there now. But following the event, these events, the owner of our house, who was also one of those religious leaders, forced us to move. So we couldn't stay. We had to go four kilometers away, and now we're in a different region. It says, the other news is that we found out there was a judicial inquiry concerning us. About 45 days ago, the director of the police and four of his officers came to our house at night. Hmm. Not in the day, at night. And that, that, that says something, that they're up to something. If they came in the day, that might be a normal kind of investigation. This is a nightly thing. And they asked us for our passports, and I thought, oh, this is just a visa check at night. That's interesting. But to my question of what was wrong, they told me that the religious leaders had called them, informing them that my wife and I were spreading a foreign religion in the area. So they summoned me to the office the next day to answer questions, and they kept our passports that night. And the next day, I went to the office, I answered the questions, they put it in writing, and I had to sign it. And that began a journey of potentially uh, another inquiry of what could happen. They got their passports back. And all I can tell you is the short version of this is God did an amazing work in this time because they were told they can't leave the area. And then through a series of circumstances, the chief of police of this region, they lost paperwork, he got sick, there was all kinds of things that happened, and this problem disappeared. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think God had a, his hand involved in this. And God is constantly working, right? He's constantly working. He says, look, you're going to have to speak. I'm going to have to protect you, though, and I would love to do that. Will you go and do what I've asked, though? Will you do that? And Jeremiah, in our story, did, and our missionaries do, and people around the world continue to be persecuted. But the story goes on with Jeremiah a third time. This is an important story in chapter 38. Remember I said, first of all, this book is written where you have to go. It's not a chronological story, so I'm jumping all over. That's why I say, keep up with me. Here we go. But chapter 38 Jeremiah, they take him, they cast him into a cistern, um, which was Malchijah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guardhouse, and they let him down with ropes. Now in the cistern there was no water, but only mud, and Jeremiah sank into the mud. For those of you who haven't ever dug cisterns, it's basically a well. It's a place to store water. And this one apparently had had a leak in it, so it was just a muddy mess, and there he is sinking in the mud, perhaps like quicksand. And imagine that this is probably a time when he thinks, well, this is it. I've been beaten, I've put in stocks, I've been, had death sentences put on me, and now this is going to follow through. I'm going to die here in the mud. And I think uh, in that time, I think we have to, to understand, there was a, a cool thing, you make a note of this if you want, go back and read Jeremiah chapter 2. You're going to see a statement about cisterns. I find it interesting that he gets put in a cistern, and one of the very things that God said is, these people have refused to see me as living water. Instead, they dig their own cisterns, they, like their own idols, and try to fill it with living water, and they're just leaking everywhere, because I'm the God that's living water. Just kind of a cool study. You can go look at that on your own, but <clears throat> I think it's important we look at something. You see, Jeremiah was that 
guy who said, I'm too young, and we're down the road now. He's probably close to 50 years old. Remember, we said he was about 17 to 22-ish when God called him very clearly. And now he's down the road, and I want you to see the response because some people in the community said, look, he can't die down there. That's not right. And so there's this King Zedekiah. He says, all right, bring him out. And, and in chapter 38, this is what happens. We don't see a young Jeremiah. We see a Jeremiah who's been through the ringer now. He has had to endure persecution, and I think what we see is a boldness of a guy who's finally figured out that God does have him covered, that God will rescue him. So he's extracted out, and here's what the king says. The king Zedekiah says, um, send Jeremiah the prophet to me. So he brings him to the temple of the Lord, and then King Zedekiah says, I'm going to ask you something. Don't hide anything from me. Okay? Jeremiah says to him, but if I give you an answer, you're just going to kill me. And then he says, even if I give you counsel, you wouldn't listen to me. I think he's pretty bold here. Like, what's the, what are you going to do? You're going to kill me anyways. Like, put me back in the hole, I guess. And then Zedekiah swears an oath of secrecy. So this is now kind of a private conversation. He's like, I think there's something going on here. And he says, look, as surely as the Lord lives and who has given you breath, in other words, I recognize who you serve, I will neither kill you or hand you over to those who want to kill you. And then I love Jeremiah's response. He says, well, this is what the Lord, the God Almighty, the God of Israel says, and he lays it out for him. If you don't leave and surrender... You're going to die. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to tell you exactly what's up. So I think we see the development of one of God's people, and that's God's heart to develop you and me. And through his life, Jeremiah honored God by doing what he was instructed, what he was commanded. And so the next question is, are you honoring God? Are you honoring God with your life? How do you respond in difficult circumstances? And how do the people around you watch? What do they see? So if you're in a school setting, perhaps, maybe you're in the high school, junior high, maybe you're in college, when you go to your classes, when the tests are difficult, when you're in your common meeting areas, maybe the lunchroom, how do you respond when things are tough? And importantly, how do you respond when things are good? Does God get the glory when things are good too? Or only the bitterness when things are bad? What do they see in you is the question. As you go to work, as the people around you, the people who work around you, do they go, man, I know they're a Christian. They have to be. Look at how they deal with things. Look at how honest they are in the way they work. Look at how I can't, they're always telling the truth. And they're always loving people, and they're always caring about the company and what's going on. What is unique about this person? Is that you? Or do people go, yeah, they, I'm sure they do go to church on Sunday, but I don't see any impact this week. I don't see anything different about them. Good for them. They're just like anybody else going to church. No difference. So are you honoring God with your life? It doesn't necessarily mean it will be easy. But because in our story, Jeremiah was faithful, God allowed him to be an instrument to bring good news as he honors him. And so we look in the story, and here's the good news that begins to come. The people of the day of this writing of Judah, what they would have heard is this. Here's what they would have heard. The days are coming, declares the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. First, I'm going to reunite these two kingdoms and bring you back to what I called you to, all of the people of Israel. And so they're probably really excited about this new news. And a new covenant, oh, I wonder what that will be. In fact, it goes on, it says in chapter 31, uh, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when they took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was like a husband to them or was a husband, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their minds and write on their hearts. I will be their God and they'll be my people. This new covenant isn't going to be written on tablets 
It's going to be on hearts because the Spirit of God will dwell in these people who will be in this new covenant. Something new is about to happen. And, and so far, perhaps, the people of this time would have read it and said, oh man, that's, that's, just, that's just for us, the Israelites. This is going to be a great new covenant for us. And then we go on, it says, no longer will they teach their neighbors or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the grace of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Well, that's an interesting dilemma. You see, we we're used to the whole sacrifice of animals, and that's the system that, that we have to do these offerings. This was part of the, the old covenant, and it wasn't forgotten. It was just covered. What do you mean it's going to be forgotten? And so for those of you real quick who noticed, if you want to figure this out, you can go to Hebrews, that little reference there, chapter 8. That's the direct quote of this. They're both the same. Because the writers of Hebrews, this is New Testament now, are telling the Jews of that time, hey, remember what Jeremiah said? Jesus came, he died and he rose again, and now he's ascended into heaven. And I'm telling you that this is who we're talking about. This new covenant is coming. It's formed, it's started, and you can be a part of it. It's a cool thing. And here's something I just want to stop and just take this idea. There are many people who say, Old Testament, I don't even read it. That's so for, that's so for them. That's gone. That's done. Big deal. I'm only going to do New Testament because that's about me. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't know your Old Testament, it is the building block of the new. It's the foundation. In fact, that's why the authors and Jesus himself continually points back to the Old Testament writers, the Old Testament prophets, and says, look what I was doing <laughs> to tell you I was coming to remind you I'm coming again. Amen. Look what I was doing. It's important. He comes through. And this next piece, chapter 33, this is the specific reference talking about Jesus. It says this, chapter 33, verse 14, these days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days, and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. There is an important thing that just happened here. One, you of Judah and Jerusalem, I know you're thinking safety, that's great. You're expecting me to rebuild your little kingdom and you'll just live in safety and peace forever. And that's what they were hoping for. And that's what they expected when Jesus arrived. But he says, this is not just that. He said, this is a new promise to all the people. So if you want to make a note and go back and read Genesis chapter 12, you can go read about Abraham and how Abraham spoke to God and said, hey, through you will come one that will bless all nations. That's what we're getting to, all nations. But here's something I want to point out. This is, this is a big deal, so I'm going to pause. If any of you have been a part of a Jehovah Witness faith or know somebody, first I want to say I'm not here to bash them. I am here to bring truth and light, hopefully that you can share, or if you're even still wrestling perhaps, but here's something important, so I'm going to show you some names. I know you can't read them all, but here's the idea. The Lord our righteousness, the, the word in the, the Jewish was Yehovah Sitkinu. I am not Greek, so that probably was way wrong, or Hebrew, or whatever else. I'm not that, but here's the deal. One of the names that the Lord our righteousness was Jehovah Sitkinu. And then there's, there's Jehovah Rapha, and there's lots of Jehovah names that all describe one God period. We have Elohim, we have El Shaddai, we have all these names to describe God as the warrior, the most high, Lord, the most high, the one that heals, the shepherd. All these phrases refer to God. And so I'm going to go back. I want to show you something. What the twisting has happened as false prophets come is they take a scripture like this and they tweak it with a few vowels and add a word. And so the way it's written now for those who follow in Jehovah's Witness is they take this. See the, the term righteous branch, the righteous branch, and he will be called, this will be the name, the Lord our righteousness. They take it and they apply it to the city. They, they twist it with a few letters so that it says that Jerusalem will live in safety and it 
will be called, or she will be called, Jerusalem will be called the Lord our righteous Savior. That is not what this is saying. This says that righteous branch is the Lord our righteous Savior. And his name happens to be Jehovah. Oh no, we have a problem. (laughs) You have to understand where they're coming from is this is one of the many names. And guess what? Jesus is who we're talking about. And it was prophesied for years and and all of the prophecies about Jesus were fulfilled. And he did show up. He did arrive. And so in this process, you have to learn to seek who God is. He has lots of names. So my question to you then is, are you seeking to know God? What names do you know of God? Do you only see him as the guy on the anthill, perhaps, frying the ants with the magnifying glass? Is that how you know God? Is that all you know about God? That he, only, he doesn't do what I ask when I ask him to or as fast as I wish he would? Are you seeking to know him? God wants to be known. I can <clears throat> give you a few ideas of what that might look like. I can remember a time in, uh, when my stepdad, he died on a motorcycle wreck, and, and that was a very emotional, difficult time, and I sat up in, in this auditorium, and for weeks and weeks during worship and message, I just, I couldn't even think, I just sobbed. It was a hard, hard journey. And I think about, that was a time when God walked with me, and I walked with God. Now, I know that it's a visual. It's not like all of a sudden he showed up, we linked arms, and we hung out, but we did He was here, and I walked with him, and he walked with me, and he counseled me through that process, and that's one of the ways I got to know God more is I realized, man, I'm I'm hurting, but there's something about your spirit in me that's comforting me. What about talking to God? You ever just talk to God instead of sit down and say, thanks for the food, and I'm gone? You ever, instead of just coming to God and saying, hey, will you fix my problem, do you ever just talk to God and get to know him? As you read his word, do you ever just thank him and say, man, I can't believe you would do this. I can't believe the way you, you worked with Jeremiah. I can't believe how you protected him. I can't believe and just have these conversations of thanksgiving and say, thank you, God. Do you ever just get to know him? I spent a lot of time reading this for facts, like I was going to be on Jeopardy someday. Not going to happen. I have a terrible retention. I just, I have to keep going back. So I'm glad it's written. <laughs> If I'm ever in like some kind of persecuted state where they're like, all right, everybody bring what they remember, I'm going to be like, I don't have much. <laughs> I got a couple key verses. <laughs> but man, I know where things are. I can find them. <laughs> Thank goodness it's written. But I used to read for knowledge, not for relationship. And then I started to read to say, God, show me who you are. And I started to watch people. Show me who you are. I see you operating in people. I want to get to know how you love like that. That person there, they love really well. That's you, I see. How do I do that? I want to get to know you. And so how we communicate and when we serve, when we give out of our finances, when we give out of our heart, when we give people in need, when we help people, when we stop to pray, all these pieces are getting to know God. And that's his desire. You see, remember what I said is God is serious about you. And are you serious about him? Are you really serious? Are you, are you spending the time to get to know him? I love one of my favorite thoughts is, you know, someday we're all going to see God and he may just ask, hey, did you read my book? It was a bestseller, right? And that was the time when I heard that, that I decided I better read his book. <laughs> I don't want to have that embarrassing moment. Yeah, I had a lot of movies I was watching. I got in the way. But uh, are you reading his word? Are you getting to know him? He's serious about you. So how serious is God about you? I'm going to show you one last slide. I'll kind of read it and then explain the heart of God here. And here it is. It comes in chapter 33 as well. Referring to the covenant that is coming, again, in Jeremiah's time, the covenant was coming, Jesus, right? The new covenant. And he will return again, by the way. That's what we get to look forward to. But it says this, if I have not made my covenant with day and night, a different covenant, by the way, if I have not made my covenant with day and night and established the laws of heaven and earth, then I will reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his sons to rule over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
for I will restore their fortunes and have compassion on them. Here's the, the summary. God would say this, how serious am I about making a covenant with, for you through myself, Christ, as I come and dwell and die and rise again? How serious am I? Has the sun ever stopped setting and rising? Nope. And if it does, then you better start to get a whole new thought, right? What is going on? He says, that's how serious I am. Has the earth stopped spinning? Have the stars fallen from the skies? None of this has happened, and that's how serious I am. I put these laws in motion. I hold everything together, and I'm so serious about it that these things are the evidence that I made a covenant with the Son to say this is what you will do, and it will not stop doing what I commanded. That's how serious I am. In fact, I'm so serious that if one of these stops, then basically I'll reject what all the stuff I did. Well, I thank God that the sun rose again today. And there's my security and my hope and my trust that what God says is serious. And he is serious about his covenant. So I want to send off to uh, our other two campuses. We love you guys and I'll see you in green soon. See, this is one of the cool things that God in his seriousness, he says, look, I want you to know something, and I want people here, I want you to hear this. Sometimes I know that when I speak, I may put out there and say, why do you come, why do you come? And that's not to say you shouldn't come and keep trying. I know some people might hear that. But I think, I guess I've decided that I have to live my life in a daily evaluation. From the moment I wake up, I have to begin to evaluate my life. And go back to God and say, forgive me, and I want to pursue you, and help me, and I'm sorry. And I think that is a daily thing. So so when I challenge in that way, it's not to put doubt, it's to ask the question, are you serious about what you're doing? So the the simple conclusion to today, (laughs) simple, is this. How well do you know the Lord? How well do you know? I, I would challenge you maybe this week to write down what you know about God. What do you know? Without Just what do you know? Look at your history lessons of your life. Where did God show up? Well, I know he's compassionate. I remember those times. I know he's forgiving because, well, I know he's a protector. I remember when. Make a list of those things. And the second piece would be, how would you describe your relationship with God? How would you describe it? If somebody came to you and said, man, what, who's God and what's it all about? And that? what's your life like and what's he like? How would you describe that like in a testimony? What would you tell people? What would you tell people? I hope that you leave this study not with just more knowledge. That's good. Not with just more understanding of the book of Jeremiah. That's good. But with a true desire to know God. And so if you're wondering who God is and still seeking, please begin the journey until you come to the conclusion. And the conclusion is that he is real, created everything, he holds everything by his power and might, he knows everything, he knew you before you were born, he made a plan to redeem you through Jesus Christ, he came, he left, he's in heaven, and he will come again. That is what this is about. Amen? Amen? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, thank you for just the story of how Jeremiah would even though in his youth at the beginning would still go through with following you. Thank you that you redeemed him and that you rescued him and you protected him just like you will for us. God, I pray for each person here that they would leave today with a better appreciation for a God who loves and a God that cares intimately about each one of us. We thank you, God. Thank you for today. Thank you for the sun rising. Thank you for the confidence we can put in all that you do. In your precious name, we all agreed and said? Nailed it. You guys are good. You guys are good. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. 
And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.